It's uh, a great honor to have uh, Alon Olitsky here to give the distinguished lecture, computer science distinguished lecture. Uh, so Alon uh, uh, came to the US in 81 uh, at Stanford uh, and got his master's and went on to PhD with uh, Abbas Al Gamal in information theory. And by the time he graduated in 86, he wanted to work with the best of the best. So he said he'd go to Bell Labs. Uh, and work with Shannon, the, the person who invented uh, information theory. But when he got there, he found out that Shannon had, had already left in the 50s. So, uh, and he did his big work in 1948. So, but there were many other big shots there, and that was the place to be for information theory. And uh, Alon stayed there for a whole decade, and then decided that he, has, he likes uh, the California sunshine better, so moved to you see San Diego, and uh, and uh, he's had an amazing career. He's uh, the Qualcomm professor there uh, of information theory. Um, he is IEEE fellow. He got the Baker Award. He got the Shannon Award. He also uh, was the president of the Information Theory Society for a year. Um, and you know, I'm really honored to be a friend of his. Uh, um, uh, even though <coughs> I typically don't make friends with the presidents uh, because they tend to be messy people, but in this case, uh, everything has been good so far. So, thank you and thank you for coming. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, so we just said I was president for a year. That sounds like something. Oh, you did that? Yeah. I need to speak uh, a little louder. So he said I was president for a year. Sound, something like something happened. But that's actually the, uh, the, the term for, for the society. And he also, uh, Vijay also mentioned that uh, I came to Bell Labs because of all the great people that were there. And he forgot to tell you that he was there at the time. So maybe that oh was yeah, the reason. So, right, okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's start. So we're going to talk about um, learning robustly when the information comes from sources that you cannot trust. And we'll see that the best things in life are almost free. Uh, this is joint work with my student who is uh, graduating as we speak, I use So, um, we're going to talk about some fundamental learning tasks, and we'll see what happens when they're based on corrupt data, and then we'll see how we can learn robustly, even in the presence of uh, corruptions. And we'll do it uh, when you have different sources that provide you the data, which is often the case. And we'll talk about a few applications. One is to density estimation, uh, and then we'll talk about discrete distribution, continuous distribution, and classifications. And we'll see that you can learn almost as well uh, as you would from uh, genuine data when there's no corruption. So we uh, could say that we live in the golden age of uh, machine learning uh, in the sense that um, uh, many important... Um, Will we get the volume up a little bit? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. And uh, maybe I'm just trying to think that maybe what I want to do is compile it a little differently. Just give me one second. Um, so just one second here. Sorry, it has my name on top. Why? <laughs> What's that? 
Why do you have my name up there? Uh, <laughs> because I was looking for uh, an email from you. Um, okay, just give me a second. Uh, hand out. <coughs> no. So you work so hard on getting all the transitions right, so may as well just use that. So, uh, so as we said, we live in the golden age of machine learning uh, in the sense that you have many important applications that you can like, learn accurately with more than three sources. By more than three sources, we mean a fairly small amount of data and very short computational time. And these great results that people achieve are built on theoretical advances that people make on learning fundamental learning paradigms. For example, hypothesis testing, a little more complex than this is density estimation, uh, maybe once you have density estimation, you can do classification, or you can regress, or you can cluster, and do reinforcement learning, and eventually, hopefully, get some theory for deep neural nets. And uh, for all of these, uh, people obtain very nice results. And what they show is that the amount, as the amount of data increases, the error in computation de decreases, and you can furthermore do it using polynomial time algorithms. They would Okay, cool. So we're going to, in this talk, mention mostly two applications. One is to density uh, estimation, and the other one is to classification. I'll try to make it pretty uh, basic so people can hopefully understand everything. Okay, so let's start with density estimation. So there's a uh, known distribution, or density if it's continuous, known distribution class, uh, but you don't know which distribution in the class is in effect, and this distribution uh, generates samples. And from the samples, you want to estimate the uh, distribution. And the question, of course, is what is the best estimate? Given the samples, how can you best estimate the distribution? So let's start with discrete uh, distributions. They're simple, uh, and we can explain the results for them. So uh, you have a support set, which without loss of gen generality, we can assume it's the elements from 0 to k minus 1. Your alphabet size is, uh, is k. And we're looking at a collection of distributions, which is the set of uh, which is the set of all uh, hyperplanes uh, uh, or simplexes over over this uh, over this k, and a distribution is a collection p zero up to p k minus one, the probability of zero, the probability of one, probability of k minus of k minus one. <coughs> Each probability is at least zero, and they sum to one, as we know, and we're getting s samples. So we we'll denote the vector by x s, x one up to x s. They're distributed according to p, and they're independent. Okay. And from this, from this sample, we want to estimate the distribution. So uh, as we said, the distribution P is unknown, except we know it's in this um, simplex, in the collection distribution. And this distribution P generates XS. From XS, we want to estimate P. And so to do that, we're going to use an estimator. What is an estimator? An estimator Q, Q estimator, maps a sequence of S symbols over K uh, to a distribution. Okay, so our estimate is going to be this this estimate, this QS of the sample that we get. Now, to evaluate how well we're doing, we're going to use a distance measure, and perhaps the most uh, common distance measure is the L1 distance. So the L1 distance between the underlying distribution P and the, uh, the estimate or estimate Q is going to be just the summation of the absolute value of the differences. Summation of PI uh, minus QI, absolute value. Uh, this, this, S, this, this, this distance is so, prevalent that it has some other names. For example, people call it, or a slight variation, the total variation distance. So the total variation distance between P and Q is just the sum of all 
indices where P is bigger than Q, and because the PI is in QI sum to one, it's just half of the L1 distance. So when we say we learn L1 distance, we're also learning in total variation distance. Okay. So now the distance of our estimate when we observe the sample excess is just the distance between our estimate applied to the sample and P, and the distance, as we said, we're going to use the L1 distance. And um, the, so, so this is going to be our distance. The, the, the issue with this, the difficulty with this, is that it's a little very, spe a little specific, right? It applies to the specific estimator we're using, the specific sample we're getting, the specific uh, underlying distribution. We don't want to give an answer that depends on all those. We're looking for a more fundamental uh, view of this, the difficulty of the estimation task. And so we, we'll use what's called the mean max expected loss. So we want to, re to remove the specific sample we want to remove the underlying distribution P and so on. We want to do that, we'll do that sequentially. So first, to remove the specific sample that we observe, we lose the expectation. So our, our loss with S samples of our estimation of our estimator for the an underlying distribution P is just going to be the expected of all samples, the expectation of all samples of the distance between our estimate and P. So by doing this, we remove the sample that we observe. We just look at the expectation. We want to remove P, uh, and we'll do it by being, and want to be conservative, so we'll look at the worst possible P. So our loss of S sample of a specific estimator is going to be the, maxim be the maximum of all distributions. Sorry, why are you removing Because uh, I want to say that learning, for example, binary distribution is easy, or learning binary distribution is how, like, how difficult it is to learn a distribution over five singles. So I don't want to say, oh, for the, I got a sample 0110, my loss is something. So I'm going to look at the expectation, okay? And now, uh, it's a choice you make. You may want to say, for every P, I'll give you a loss. But what people like to, to do is they like to be conservative and say, I can learn binary distribution with, with so many samples. So we don't want to look at a specific P. For example, if P is all zero, if P is Bernoulli zero, you always <coughs> give zero, maybe that's easier to estimate. We want to look at the worst case, we want to be conservative. So we're going to look at the worst, the most difficult distribution to, to estimate. So we're looking at the maximum of all distribution in this class of the loss for these distributions. So, okay. so for example, if you so if you look for example at ChatGPT, right? It's, what it is is just like a language model that estimates, given the previous things, it estimates uh, the it estimates the next word. Now, the, it could be that that the distribution in English is someone might always say I, like me, I, 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 I. That would be very easy to to learn. Right, so every different distribution will have difficulty, different difficulty to learn. We want to say that we can always learn, so no matter what the distribution is, we can learn well. So that's why we're looking at the worst distribution. For every, for every P, every distribution P, there'll be a difficulty, and we're looking at the highest difficulty of all distributions. So that's going to be looking at mean max. So expected losses, we're looking at the expectation of how much for a given distribution we're losing, and then we're going to look at the worst distribution, and then we'll look at the best estimator for that. Okay, so the loss of the estimator is just a loss for the worst distribution, and now uh, there are different estimators, and some of them are pretty bad, right? I see I, I, I estimate Q, U, U, that, that's a pretty best estimate. So obviously we want to look at the best estimator, so we'll define the loss uh, when you learn a uh, distribution with K symbols, with S sample to be S samples to be the minimum of all estimator of the loss of this estimator. Okay, so it's what it is is the is the minimum of all estimator, the maximum of all distribution of the expected loss of the estimator. So this is, in a, in words, this is the expected loss in L1 distance of the best estimator for the worst distribution. It's called the min max expected loss, and the obvious question is what is it? So I have a distribution over, like in English, like a million samples, or half a million samples. I'm sorry, half uh, alphabet, half a, half a million words. I take 1,000 samples, how well can I estimate the distribution? That's what we're, what we're interested in. Okay, so first let's look at binary and larger alphabets. So uh, the easiest thing to explain is if you have a binary distribution, so just over 0, 1, uh, and you take n samples, so you loss, uh, and then we're going to talk about the loss for uh, arbitrary output size. Okay. So if you have the binary case, then excess, you, you see, you, each of your samples is, is distributed by nulli p independently, and you don't, p is the parameter that you don't know you're trying to estimate. Okay, so you're trying to estimate p. And so to do that, one simple way to do it is you let n be the number of ones in your samples. You see 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Let n be the number of ones. 
So n is going to be distributed polynomial with uh, parameters p and s samples. Okay. So the expected value of n, the expected number of ones, is going to be s times p, because each sample is, is one equal to p. Standard deviation is going to be square root of s, number of samples, p times one minus p. Okay. So, and then natural estimate for the probability of one is just take the number of one divided by the number of samples. So, it's, so this is the empirical estimate from, 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 from the observation of the number of samples is of, of the probability of p is the number of times one appear divided by s. Its expectation is just n we divide by s, it's n over s, which is p, right? Because n over s, expectation times p, and the standard deviation of this estimate is the standard deviation of n over s, which will just give us here p times 1 minus p over, over s in square root. This is just the standard, the typical standard, uh, if you take a binary, a binary a, a binomial distribution normalized by the number of samples, then the standard deviation is this, okay? So the, um, so now we're looking at the expected, at the expected TV distance or L1 distance between our estimate, our estimate is n over s and 1 minus n, one minus n over s and minus p and p. That's just the expected because the TV distance is just you take the largest, let's say p minus ns in absolute value, and this is nothing but. So so what we have here is p is the um, is the actual value, and n over s is our estimate. So the expected value of this distance is what's called the mean absolute deviation. It's a very closely related to the standard deviation of n over s. Okay, it's just a small constant away. So this is going to be. Uh, proportional to p times 1 minus p over s square root of that, okay? And so, and we are trying to, uh, we're going to look at the worst p. This is what we said, p is very small. There will be very small error, but we're looking at the worst distribution, so we'll take the maximum of all p. So it'll give us square root of maybe 1 over 4s, but we don't care so much about the constant. So we said that our loss is our square root of 1 over s. Okay, so you see if we have binary distribution, as the number of sample increases, we're getting um, a loss at one distance, which is sm gets smaller and smaller. Okay? Now, if you're looking at alphabet, at general alphabet size, and in case of English, let's see, we said it's like maybe half a million, so K is half a million, then uh, we actually, we, do, we derive the, the, you know, the loss from the right constant, but all we care about in, in this talk is that your loss is, um, is proportional to square root of k over s. So k here was 2, was square root of 1 over s, but in general, square root of k over s, okay? And we'll call this the statistical limit. So even if all your samples are genuine, the best approximation you can have is a square root of the alphabet size over the number of samples. So, so this is uh, good news because um, what we see here is that uh, until the number of samples is proportional to k, to the alphabet size, of course you cannot learn the distribution. But beyond that, you'll start learning the distribution, and, and as the number of samples increases, then your loss is going to go down to zero. Uh, and this is, this is really the um, paradise that we live in. You, 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 you can learn the distribution with enough samples, you can just learn the distribution, no problem. Okay, we're good? So for VJ, that's <laughs> paradise. But, but there's, a, there's a small trouble in VJ's paradise. And what is it? Is that uh, that uh, data is often corrupt. Right? We live in the world. We collect data from different sources. Some of them are corrupt. So, um, so with big data comes big problems. The samples are corrupt. For example, this could be that there are inadvertent errors. It could be that you take measurement by um, uh, you, you know take different measurements, and some devices are faulty, uh, or maybe. Uh, you get some biased information, or there's the malicious effects, or maybe even adversary that know the actual distribution and know the other samples, and they manipulate the data so that you'll get your estimate wrong. Okay, um, and so uh, obviously we cannot, they don't tell us, oh, we fake the data, so, the, so the, the identity of the corrupt samples is unknown. Okay, and the question is, can we still learn, in this case, the distribution accurately? Okay, so, uh, so this is the, the topic for bus statistics. People have looked at it for a long time. So back in the 1970s, uh, uh, Tukey, Uber, Dono looked at it. There are many books, here are some uh, about, about that, about robust statistics. And recently, the, it's seen some revival in the theoretical computer science, machine learning. Um, 
communities. So people look at estimating, uh, uh, for example, mean in high dimensions, and there are several. I just listed here like a few papers, but there are many more. That's uh, Greg Valiant, right? Actually, both, this is Greg Valiant, that is absolutely correct, but his, his brother uh, also works on it. So it's Greg and Paul, but yeah, but yeah correct. It's not the. Really it's not less valid. That is good. Okay. Okay. So the common model that people assume is called the Huber model, and uh, I should say Huber model to distribute to distinguish from uh, power service. Uh, and so you have a point of beta which is less than half, and there's a fraction of at most beta of the samples that are corrupt. Okay. And. Um, and this graph data could be, they come from a different distribution, it could be biased, it could be arbitrary and adversarial as we described. But the remaining samples, the one minus beta fraction, are genuine. They're distributed according to P. And you can also think about generalization where the genuine data is not exactly P, but some variation. Okay, maybe not everyone, you know, maybe people have slightly different opinion about the data, but essentially. Okay. And, um, and typically, in those cases, you try to estimate distribution parameters. For example, you have Gaussian, try to estimate mean, and so on. So, so for example, people sh uh, have shown that if you take the median of S samples, then uh, it estimates uh, the mean of a univariate Gaussian to uh, at most sigma over square root of n, and I'm using this OR notation to be the maximum, so the maximum between sigma over square root of n, and beta times sigma. Beta is the fraction of um, adversarial samples, and sigma is the standard deviation. Okay? And, and I should say here, that if beta is bigger than half, if the fraction of samples that are bad are, is bigger than half, then clearly you cannot do anything because you'll get more than half of the samples from a totally different star distribution. So there's just no way that you can do it. So you have to assume that beta is at the most half. We're good? Uh, okay, but there is a small secret. Uh, not secret like, you know, uh, terrible, terrible secret, secret, but enough of a secret that people don't tell you right away when, uh, when they describe its results. And that is that even as the number of samples uh, go to infinity, the error uh, does not decrease to zero as we like. Okay. So if I go back quickly to, um, to here, you'll see that we have one part here that goes down with n, but here we have beta times sigma. That, will, that part will not go down as the number of samples increases. Okay. So there's a hard limit on the performance in the presence of corrupt data. You will not be able to get <coughs> zero equals, get stuck at some point. That is true for hypothesis testing, for density, and therefore anything above this, so density estimation, classification, all of those will have the same issue. That when you have data, corrupt data, you will not be able to get to zero error. Uh, and I'm going to show you a simple example of that. So, so this, if you understand this, you'll see why. So uh, take the simplest example. So alphabet size two, you have beta fraction of adversarial samples, okay? And I'll make it super easy for you. I'll tell you that the data comes from only two possible <coughs> distributions. Either Bernoulli half minus beta, minus beta over two, namely the probability of one is, is one half minus beta over two, the probability of zero is the complement, or uh, Bernoulli half plus beta over two. So either beta over two more than half probability of one or beta over two plus half probability, probability of zero. So one of these two, okay? So let's look at the case uh, of that the, the actual distribution is the, is the first one, the probability of one is one half minus beta over two. So the number of genuine samples, so there is beta times S uh, fake samples, one minus beta times S genuine samples, and the number of ones that you'll get from those is going to be one, minus, one half minus beta over two times that, that's the number of ones that you expect to get. <coughs> right, so one minus beta times S from the genuine samples, S of them, a fraction one minus beta is going to be genuine, and of those, a fraction of one half minus beta over two are going to be ones. So you open this up, you get S times, and you get from here, uh, you'll get one half minus beta over two, and then minus beta over two plus beta over two. So it's a little bigger than one minus beta. Okay, it's a little bigger than one minus beta. So now remember that the adversary looks at the data and can do what, what they want. So they'll see that you have, you have S times one half minus beta once. What they're going to do is they're going to get to add, uh, and they can control beta s time, beta s once. So what they can do is they can force uh, s over two, uh, so, so, so they, can, they can make it so that when they can add beta s, 
once, and then what would, that would mean that when you look at the whole data, that you'll see s over two zeros and s over two ones, right? Because from the genuine ones, you have s over two minus beta s, they'll make all the beta s that they control, but make the one, you'll see s over two zeros and s over two ones, and they can do the same thing for the other distribution, but only half plus beta over two, they can again force it to half zeros and half ones. So in other words, you'll get the same samples from both Bernoulli one half minus beta over two and Bernoulli one half plus beta over two, okay? And that means that you cannot learn, in, learn the other underlying distribution better than just guessing, okay? So now the TV distance between these two distributions is beta, right? And so by the triangle inequality, so you get two distributions, the distance <coughs> between them is beta. No matter which distribution you're going to pick, it's going to be, it's going to be by the triangle equality, an estimation that you'll come up with will be a distance at least paid over two from the underlying distribution. So that means that, um, that means that while, as we saw, if you, with genuine data, the error is going to go down like one over square root of s. If you, um, if you have beta fraction corrupt, and then the loss for alpha beta size two, s samples and beta, and beta um, corruptions is at least paid over two for all s. So we cannot go below that beta over two. Okay, cool. So what does that imply? So that means that the accuracy does not improve with the sample size s. It just gets stuck at some beta. So you may, so for example, if you have 20% corruptions, then you will not be able to estimate the distribution to better, uh, to distance better than 0.1, no matter how many samples you get. Now, you may ask, is this good or bad? So one thing that we need to know uh, is that many problems people struggle to get minute improvements. For example, if you look at the Netflix um, competition challenge, people won by like a fraction, okay? Or when people now talk about like large language models, when they compare language models, they compare improvements that are really, really small. So what this says is that if you, if you, if you, if you have like 1%, we'll see what percentage we should think of, but if you get like 2% corruptions, and you'll see often it's quite m much larger than that, then there's no point in, in talking about tiny, tiny improvements because you'll just not be able to get that. Okay? So many problems people try to get minute in problem, problems and, and this, this problem will propagate that, uh, that we saw here for uh, density estimation, distribution estimation problem to get to all, uh, all um, problems that are more complicated and deep. And the question of course is, is the end near? Are we done? Can we not do anything else? Okay? Right. Luckily, uh, there's a little bit of hope Okay, and that hope, at least the one we'll talk about, comes in the form of sources. So in many applications, uh, the samples are collected from multiple sources, uh, and each one provides many samples. Now, uh, in this field, people call them batches. So each, collect, each this data for, comes from source, people call it batches. Uh, maybe batch is a little more general because you can say one source that gives you different batches, maybe some of the batches but uh, are uh, corrupt, I'm going to use this term for now. So for example, if you look at sensor networks, then you get data from different sens sensors, and maybe some of the sensors are corrupt. Or you have a recommendation system, you look at uh, Yelp, maybe there are some individuals that just give you, uh, give you corrupt data. Or uh, you do uh, net, uh, natural language processing, you want to find the distribution of um, you know, uh, English, for example, but there are some people who, for some reason, they don't the, their distribution is different from what other people do. So you look at all the documents, some documents, the, the distribution is not what most people use. Um, or crowdsourcing, there's some sources that are bad or federated learning, you get information on different phones, some phone give you data that is not right, okay? Um, and the question is whether data can, that's collected from sources, some of which are untrusted, uh, can that data be learned efficiently? So that's, that's what I'm trying to, to address, okay? So, um, so, so what are we assuming? So there are untrusted sources. So most of the sources are genuine, uh, but some of them may not be. And as you know, like, as we said, there could be faulty sensors, or uh, we get fi uh, biased feedback on Yelp, on uh, Amazon, and uh, or we have text that is wrongly attributed, or some speakers are different, uh, and. Uh, the sources could be malicious, could even falsify data based on other samples. Uh, and, and now you could ask, okay, is this a real problem? Okay. And the answer is, I believe it is. So for example, um, according to CNN, um, 
5% of active Facebook accounts are fake. And we know that, uh, that uh, Twitter was almost not bought because of this problem that they underreported the number of uh, fake accounts. Uh, a study by Howard says that 20% of Yelp reviews are fake, and the BBC explains that by, because they, apparently you can buy a fake review on Amazon for five pounds, so presumably similar on Yelp. Uh, there's a company that tries to address this in, in ad campaigns, and they estimate that 14% of uh, campaign clicks are fraudulent, and it's true in finance. So you can see that oftentimes the, you know, there are um, the many sources that are faulty or, advers faulty or adversarial and so on. So the click sees is uh, Google Ads. So I think I think the click sees what they do is they try to help you with with uh, ad campaigns, and that's probably why they call it click sees. So they try to help you design a campaign where it will address um, uh, stuff like this, like uh, that the people try to um, uh, trick you, trick the campaign, and so on. So uh, yeah, and they could be part of uh, related to Google uh, Ads as well. Okay. Right. Okay. But what I want to say here is that often, and you can, we can believe it, that there will be some fraction, reasonable fraction of the, of the sources that will not give you good data, for whatever reason. Okay. So the model is, uh, that we'll look at, uh, I'm going to attribute it to Xiao and, and Valent, but as we'll see, people have looked at it before. Um, and it says the alphabet size is K, so we assume you have M sources, and as we said, we call them batches. And each source uh, provides n samples. You can relax that. Um, and in the good, in the good batches, um, the samples are ID from some distribution P, and you can relax it to similar to P. And in the adversarial ba batches, they could be arbitrary. They may even depend on P or even the good batches. And you have an upper bound beta on the fraction of adversarial batches. And the question is, um, what is the loss in this case? So again, you have alphabet size k, you have m sources, each one gives you n samples, and the fraction beta of the sources are uh, 40. So it's pretty similar to what we talked about before, that the fraction beta of the samples are 40, except here the 40 samples concentrate in specific sources. They're not distributed over everything, but there are some sources that are good, and other sources that are bad. Fra altogether, fraction beta of, this, of the sample is 40. We're good? Okay, cool. So, so, so the question, first question is why should batches or sources help? And so here again is a simple example. So suppose that you have, are you looking at a binary alphabet, k is equal to two, and you just take three samples, uh, three batches. I just want to give you a very simple example. Example, you see why batches will help you. So uh, you take three batches, and let's say beta is uh, one third. So in other words, maybe one source will be adversarial, and two of the sources uh, or the batches are going to be genuine. So as the batch size n increases, okay, the genuine batches will converge to p, like one over square root of n. Right? And the adversarial one could be anything. So all you need to do is find a distribution q that it is within one over square root of n from the two batches. You have two coins that are Bernoulli p, another coin which is Bernoulli something else. The two Bernoulli p, the, you estimate is going to be p plus one plus minus one over square root of n. So you'll see that there are two estimates that are very close to each other within one over square root of n. So we'll just take one of them. And, uh, and so there will, be, there will be a q which is within one over square root of n from, from two batches. And, and we know that because, you, for example, p, the distribution p will be one over square root of n from the two genuine batches. Okay? And so, so, so you find such a distribution, and, uh, and this will be within uh, one over square root of n from, 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 from p. So this shows you if you have batches, it's very easy, right? I mean, like you have. Uh, you, you just look at the estimates for all the all the distributions, uh, all the I'm sorry, all the batches. There will be a large fraction of batches that will be about the same. So this is the actual distribution, um, and and, um, and and you'll be correct. Okay. So the difficulty will come when so this is for binary alphabet. That one is easy. But when the alphabet is large, like it is in English, and like in almost all applications that people look at these days, when the alphabet size is large, then it's not as easy as this to find each distribution. There's a lot of randomness there. Okay. Okay. So this um, um, problem, I don't know. It looks like the the um, 
Xiao and Valiant did not, were not aware of this, but uh, many years ago, uh, Dono and Liu uh, looked at a problem that is very similar to this. So they looked at a general framework um, for a problem that they were looking at. So you have a collection of, parametric collection of distributions, okay? And you get S samples, and again, uh, a fraction of one minus beta will come from some distribution in this collection, F theta, or some theta, and the rest are, could be adversarial. And they want to estimate theta, in this case, the parameter of the, of the distribution, to some distance measured. So for example, you can say I have um, uh, Bernoulli P, P is the parameter, I want to estimate P to some, to some distance, but it's a little more general than that. Okay. And they give a general low bound. It says that for every number of sample S and any beta, the loss that you'll have will be at most, at least half, of the largest distance between um, two parameters of the distribution theta and theta prime, such that the TV distance between them is, between, between these two distributions is less than or equal to beta. And this is, when you think about it, it's very, very similar. If you think about it for a minute, we see it's very similar to the example I gave you with the binary samples, because if the TV distance between the two distribution is small, then you can fake it. So the TV distance, you have two distributions, and some of them here, you know, you have some probability where one is larger than the other, then you can just find a distribution G that you'll add to, that you'll add to F, and another distribution G, in this case, G was adding once. And, and G prime, in, in our case, was adding zeros, such that you can equalize these two distributions. It's essentially the same as the, the example that we gave. So therefore, the adversary will make all the distribution look the same, and then you will, you will not know, and you make an error. So basically, you need to look at, the, at all the distributions such that the uh, TV distance between them is less, all collection such a TV distance between them is less than beta, and then you look at the highest difference in the parameters between such two distributions, that's the other two. It's really the same example that I gave you before. So, so, um, so like I said, um, Valiant and Xiao and Valiant, they, they didn't use this, but the, 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 the result is essentially the same. So, uh, so one thing you can do in, in our case of um, batches is if you have a collection, if you have a batch, uh, all the samples come from the same distribution. It's really a multinomial distribution parameter P because all you care about is I took maybe I took M, uh, I took n samples from from this distribution, each the same, the same probability P. So I get a multinomial. All I care about is how many zeros appeared, how many ones appeared, how many twos appeared in this collection. It's a multinomial distribution. So each each batch is uh, really distributed according to a multinomial distribution, and this falls exactly in the framework of Dono Ho and Liu because. You now have each batch has some multinomial distribution, and you have m batches. And the question is, uh, how well can you learn it? So, so you can you can apply the the result that I just <coughs> told you to FP, which is multinomial with parameter p, and the number of samples is uh, is n because you have n samples in each batch. Okay, and what you can show. Again, it's the same proof as the one I gave you before, is that for all k, m, and n, and beta less than half, the loss is going to be, uh, this is the result that, that Dono and you had, is it going to be at least beta over two times two square root of n. Again, this is intuitive, because the worst thing you can do for all distributions is actually look at binary distribution. So this, this result, it looks more, more general, but actually goes back to the sample that I gave you about the points. And for the coins, it's easy to see that, um, you, that the adversary can, can trick you uh, by, beta over two square, by beta over square root of n. Let's not worry about the constant. Because uh, every batch will have a standard deviation, which is, which is order of 1 over square root of n, each batch. So what the adversary will do, they'll put all the batches, they'll make them look with the same standard deviation, 1 over square root of n, and they'll have beta of them. So, so they, can, they can move it, they estimate, by beta over square root of n. Okay, so so um, so this again is just as in the binary case and so on, okay, and this gives us an adversarial lower bound. So we have uh, we have the statistical lower bound that we said before, square root of k over s, and we have an s here is m times n, and we have now also the adversarial lower bound which is beta over square root of n. 
So for the upper bound, they found an upper bound uh, that is close to, to this, is close to this um, low bound. And what I showed is for beta less than 1 over 900, so it's a little small. Uh, but still, for beta, which is less than uh, 1 over 900, uh, you can actually get um, uh, a loss which is uh, close to the low bound. So, so the low bound is at least, you cannot do better than, than the adversarial low bound, this one. And you can also not do better than the um, statistical low bound. Statistical low bound, remember, was k divided square root of k over s, and s is m times n, so k over ma. So clearly, you cannot do better than the maximum of these two low bounds. And so they got close to it. Uh, they have another n. So for example, if your batches are very large, then you'll get your k over m, which is not tight. But if n is sufficiently small, then maybe the plus n is not a big deal. The, um, the I would say, bigger deal was that the algorithm running time exponential in k. So if you're talking about English, is impossible to write. So back in 2019, um, both Ayush, Jane, and me, uh, we had a, you know, um, a, poly a polynomial uh, time algorithm that, that has a linear complexity. And then um, Chen and Moi tried, they had a, uh, an algorithm that ran quasi-polynomial time. Okay, and quasi-polynomial sample complexity, so not, not, not quite as good. Uh, but they have really nice results. Okay. So, uh, so what are the results that we can show? Uh, we can show um, that we can learn in um, we can learn in um, so the, so the low bound, the statistical low bound, is square root of k divided by the number of samples s, which is m times n, and the adversarial low bound is beta divided by square root of n. Both of those are very intuitive, as we said, and um, you can we we could find an estimator such that for beta not less than 1 over 900, but just beta less than 0.49, let's say, um, the loss is basically the low bound, basically the, 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 the maximum of uh, these two, beta over square root of n and k divided by uh, mn, except that you need to multiply by log of 1 over beta. So now if you think that you have maybe 10% corruption, then it's log of 10, square root of that, maybe that's not a big, huge concern. Okay, but that, that's the difference from the low bound and the upper bound. And um, maybe I'll say something about that in a second. So, um, okay, so, so, so some good news about this. First of all, it works for all beta, which is less than 0.49. You don't need to get to 1 over 900, probability of uh, corrupt, fraction of corrupt sources. Um, and achieves both the low bound, so um, uh, both lower bounds, it achieved the statistical low bound up to a constant factor and achieves the adversarial low bound up to a small factor of log of square root of log of 1 over beta. And the nice thing about it is that there is no trade-off. It's not as if you want to achieve the statistical low bound, you have to be really bad on the, on, on the adversarial low bound, or vice versa, you can actually achieve both of them. And, and because of that, we'll see that this tells us that, we can, that um, you, you can deal with corrupt, corruption. It's almost, it comes to you almost free. The, the corruptions. Okay, and, and I also want to say that the square root of log of 1 over b, uh, 1 over beta, uh, people look at the same problem, uh, similar problems, uh, also for uh, Gaussian distributions, and, the, and, and they believe that this is inherent in trying to achieve like uh, a polynomial time algorithm for, 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 for such problems. Uh, we don't know though that that's necessary. Okay, the algorithm runs in polynomial time, and it's the first one to allow implementation, because it runs for normal time, it's the first time that people could run simulations, and I'll show you some. Okay? So, so this shows that robustness, so as I said, is all... How much of this stuff goes into ChatGPT? Okay, so uh, ChatGPT is, uh, deals with something that we don't deal with at all. Here, everything is, uh, what I'm telling you is about IID samples. You take the samples that are IID. Now, ChatGPT, a lot of the smartness comes from the fact that English is not uh, IID. If I say something, for most people, right. you know, it's not IID, right? And much of it is, comes from the language model. Do you assume that every word depends on the previous, you know, so many words? That's what people used to do until recently. But what the advancement, the advance of ChatGPT is that they're looking at more complex language model where, you know, what you say now may depend on what you said three sentences ago. At least one sentence is, I think, the, 
the standard. So all that will not come into here. But you can kind of see that ideally take these things and add memory and so on, maybe there's something could be said. But this is just for IID distributions. And because we're not thinking it of it like chat GPT, we're thinking it of trying to learn the distribution, which is very similar, like learning the distribution is very similar to predicting. What chat GPT does is just try to predict the, the probability of the next word. So they're trying to learn the distribution given the past. And we're just assuming you're just getting samples. So it's ID. It's okay. So, 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 like I said, first implementation. So we could write, uh, we, we could show, we could write experiments and show results. But before I want to do that, I want to explain why we say that robustness is almost free. So again, alphabet size k is k, batch size is n, m is the number of batches, and beta is the adversarial fraction. The lower bound, uh, statistical square root of k times the number of samples, m n. Uh, the, the robustness lower bound is beta over square root of n. And what we can show is that you can achieve both of them, but maybe with a small log one over beta factor for the uh, for the robust for for the uh, robustness lower bound. Okay. Um, so um, so so the statistical lower bound square root of k over m n is true even for genuine samples, and the adversarial lower bound um, is um, if if you look at as we said, if you look at individual samples, then it was beta over two, right? When there were no batches, but when there are batches, we said you can get to beta over square root of n. So, so now you can see that if your desired error is below that Bercer low bound, below this low bound, Bercer bound, clearly you cannot achieve it. <coughs> okay. But if uh, if it's above the low bound times times this factor, square root of log of one over one of beta, then you can then you can achieve the statistic the, the I'm sorry if it's above this this value then you can achieve the statistical low, low bound right because it's the maximum of the two so if if so so in other words you have in mind I'm trying to achieve a specific error I'll give you an example in a second I'm trying to achieve an error of let's say point one if this error is below the adversarial low bound there's nothing you can do but if the, your error is above the adversarial low bound times some small complex, some small factor, then because it's the because of this kind of independence, it's the maximum of the two. So if it's above this one, then it's just determined by this this value here, and so you can achieve the statistical low bound. Okay. So for example, suppose that beta is 0.1, 10% corruptions, n is 1,000, not very large. That's the number of samples that each source give you. Uh, then uh, beta times this factor is, is, is half a percent. Okay? So if you're trying to achieve an error which is less than half a percent, you will not be able to do it. But if you're trying to achieve an error which is, let's say, 0.6 of a percent, then it just depends on whether it's above or below the, <coughs> the statistical low bound. If it's below the statistical low bound, you will not be able to do it regardless of whether there are errors or not. If it's above the statistical low bound, then you will be able to do it, even with uh, corruptions. So it shows that robustness comes almost free. If you're trying to get too low of an error, you cannot do it. But if you're trying to get above the above the low bound, then you can do it with as many samples as you need if there are no corruptions. Right. Okay. So you have the, the experiment, as we said, uh, that this allows us to do. So uh, p uh, is a random distribution in the k alphabet simplex, um, and we looked at different adversarial distributions uh, with. Uh, Varied different TV distances from P, and what we're actually showing you the results for the worst adversary. So, uh, and we're going to compare the algorithm, the performance of the algorithm, to two estimators. One is a naive empirical estimator. So, the, so we're trying to compare the performance to two different estimators. One is going to be pretty bad. The other one is going to be better than than unrealistically good. So the bad one is the naive empirical estimator. So it doesn't use it, utilize the batch structure. It just looks at all the samples, ignore the fact that some of them correct, some of them incorrect. It just looks at all the samples and just look at the empirical frequency of that. Okay? So it estimates here is the empirical distribution of all the samples, whether they're bad or not bad. It doesn't know. And notice that because we're not assuming here it doesn't use the structure, then it could make an error of beta over two that goes back to our original sample because I don't take into account all the samples, including the beta fraction that are incorrect, so the error could be beta over two. The second one is, is uh, you know, optim too optimistic, is an oracle, 
it knows the identity of the adversarial samples. So it can know which samples, which batches are bad, which batches are good. For the good, it just takes the good batches and, and looks at the empirical distribution over those good batches. Okay, so, so this is not affected at all by the adversarial batches. Okay, this is obviously the best you could hope for. And it will therefore achieve the statistical law bound. Remember, it's k divided by the number of samples, the number of samples m times n times the one minus beta, which is a fraction of correct uh, of, of, of good batches. Okay? So these are the results. We'll see how we're doing in time. Um, so uh, these are the results. Um, so maybe just briefly. So um, so we choose them here so that um, m times n times 1 minus beta is going to be constant. So that means that if you look at, so here in um, the um, the blue is the empirical uh, estimator, the bad one. The red is the um, oracle that knows the, the, which, which batches are good. And the green is our one. So you can see that um, as beta increases, uh, as, and remember there's a low bound of beta over two, so the empirical will, will incur this, this, this loss of beta over two. Because we're keeping this, this is the, the good number of samples, we're keeping it constant as we change beta, then the, um, the, um, the oracle will, will get a constant result, and ours just follows it very closely. Okay. Um, here we vary the batch size. So because when the best you can do with adversaries is the, the square root of uh, the, the beta over square root of n, um, and so as n is the batch size, so as the batch size is small, we cannot do well. But as the batch size increases, then we can you can see that we approach the performance of the oracle and so on. Okay, so um, maybe we don't have time for a lot of stuff. Um, skip this. Um, so, okay. so maybe, um, right, so, okay, so how, how far, five more minutes? Okay, let me tell you uh, quickly about learning. So this was about learning um, discrete distribution. Distribution, let me tell you about learning um, continuous distributions. So when you want to learn uh, continuous distributions, um, uh, you have to tell a story. Because you cannot learn a continuous distribution from any number of samples. Let's say you take a million samples, you'll just see a few things appearing, none will appear twice. You don't know if it comes from a distribution, some continuous distribution, some discrete distribution that has those discrete values. There's no way to learn a continuous distribution. So you must come up with a story to explain how you do it. Uh, and the old story used to be that you restrict yourself to a collection of distributions. I'm going to learn Gaussian distributions. So I have a Gaussian distribution, now I can learn a distribution. Or a Gaussian mixture. Some, some, some parametric uh, collection of distributions. There are other ways, that's maybe the simplest one. Recently what people have looked at is trying to learn almost as well as uh, a given collection of distributions. So I'll explain it here. So, so, um, so um, a T piece degree D distribution is a distribution that consists of T pieces, each, uh, each of which is a degree D polynomial. And we let PTD be collection, the collection of all T piece degree D distributions. So for example, PT0. So here, for example, is a four, four piece, one, two, three, four, four pieces. Uh, and each, each part is a degree three distribution. So for example, PT0 is, is a collection of all histogram consisting of T flat steps. Or PT1 is the collection of all distributions that consists of T linear uh, distributions. And what you want to do is you want to approximate any dis distribution, any continuous distribution, even more general than. Um, um, so, oh, I'm sorry. And, and the, the nice thing about this is that, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I was going to say in a second, is that you can approximate any continuous distribution or any piecewise continuous distribution uh, by such distributions. Okay, with large enough T and D. So, and for many distribution, actually, you can approximate it with very low T and D. So, for example, here's a Gaussian distribution. Okay, and you can see that you can approximate it with four piece degree three polynomial. You can approximate it very well. So, just here, like one, two, three, four 
pods and you can approximate the distribution really well already with four piece degree three distribution. So, so you need, these parameters can be very small and you can approximate many common distributions. So come, couch some distribution, lock on cave, low model, you can approximate like that. Okay, and what, and so, um, so what you can show is that you can approximate, so, so if you have an arbitrary distribution, okay, then you can approximate it as well as the closest TP's degree di distribution with, uh, with a factor of two plus some term that goes to, goes to zero as the number of samples, which is m times n increases. Okay? So now we have a new statistical low bound, so we're trying to learn a continuous distribution. And what you can say is that, you c this is a result that people have known, uh, that uh, you can approximate it to like the closest you have an arbitrary distribution, you don't limit the collection of distribution that you have, but you'll say, what you say is I'll approximate as far as the closest T piece degree D uh, distribution and, and, and there's a factor that you need to incur tw twice. So one is necessary, you will not be able, that by definition, you will not be able to do better, but in fact you can learn it up to uh, a factor of two. Um, plus, there will be some statistical error from that you don't have enough samples. You go down with t times d is, is the number of parameters. It's what we call k before, divided by m x the same. And there's also an adversarial load bound that's like that. And what we can show is uh, that um, you can uh, we, we have like a polynomial time estimator that uh, for a small constant alpha, which is um, Roughly three. Okay, then we can learn achieve essentially achieve this this lower bound. So we, we can learn it after that. Maybe instead of two, we have maybe three. We can prove it in some cases. Um, and plus, uh, again, there will be this slow bound, uh, statistical lower bound times the log. And here we'll incur some polylogarithmic loss as well. Okay, so again, you can see that um, you can learn also continuous distributions. Um, almost as well as when there were no corruptions, because the low bound we get is very similar to what we got before. Okay, so maybe just just quickly show you the experiment. So, um, right. So so here the general distribution is a mixture of two Gaussians. Okay, minus mean at minus two, this one and mean at one. You get this, and then you corrupt it in our experiments by another Gaussian distribution. Okay. So now if you look at the empirical distribution, we'll give you the mixture of these three. So the empirical distribution doesn't know which one's correct, which one's not. It gives you the mix of these three distributions, and it tried to estimate it by degree one, uh, by, uh, uh, by degree one distribution, so, so linear. So the, the empirical will give you this red line, which is really off. The oracle that knows the actual distribution will give you this blue estimate. And as you can see, uh, we're very close. And if you want to move from um, if you want to move from linear polynomial to degree two polynomials, then it gets even better. Okay. Right. So um, so there are results for classifications that uh, we don't have time for, but they're very similar again. And so um, right. So so just to summarize, so we looked at robust le learning where some when some sample are corrupt, and then we said that if you have a better fraction of the samples that are corrupt then you have a hot limit on the accuracy. You will not be able to get below data over two. Um, but then we said, let's look at crop that learning from batches, which happens when you get the data from different sources. So it arises in many applications, like sensor networks, like uh, recommendation systems, language, natural language processing, and so on. So here we said that a better fraction of the batches or the sources are corrupt and can even be adversarial. And then we derived in this context a few firsts. First is the first computationally efficient algorithm. Uh, that is also essentially optimal, also reduced the, uh, the gap to the low bound, and that allows get us uh, simulations for discrete distributions, got decent results, uh, and then uh, we talked about estimating of continuous distribution. We said that in order to do that, you need to reformulate the question, um, which we described, and again, we got something which is new optimal, and uh, the algorithm is sufficient, and we didn't talk about classification, but you can also get uh, new optimal algorithms for that. And hopefully, convinces us that the best thing in life are almost free. You can deal with this if you want to get there's a low bound. If you want to get below it, once you have this corruption, that gives you a low bound on the correction. 
If you want to get below it, you cannot. But if you want to get above that, then you, don't, you need about the same samples, number of samples as, you, as if everything was genuine. Uh, so yeah, so up to the adversarial low bound, you can achieve the same accuracy as genuine samples. And this is it. Thank you. I had two questions um, to see if I understood it well. Uh, first, we don't know beta, right? Like That's a very, very, very good question. Uh, so, uh, so beta is the, is the fraction of correct samples. And uh, so the way I describe it here is someone gives you a parameter beta, let's say at most 20%, and, um, and, and, and then you design the algorithm. And when we wrote this paper, in fact, that was correct. That's, that's how we phrased it, and other people as well. So you design for 20%, and then, um, and then if it's above it, then you cannot do it. If it's below it, then, then you'll do it. But if it's, it's a lot below it, if you design 20%, but in fact it's only 1%, then you're losing the results because you have beta that comes. So after that, we realized that there's a way to do it um, um, uh, without knowing. So it's kind of a, a nice, uh, more general trick that you can do. So, so there's a paper here that uh, I can show you. Uh, that we, that we show how it, why we don't need beta. The sad news is that we then found that while this result was new, the technique that we used uh, we show you that we didn't have two questions. Yeah, the second one was, I'm not a lot into this field, so I don't know if I'm not getting this very well. But so with this estimator, you can get how low can you get in your loss, right? So you estimate how as small can the error be, and then you run your learning algorithm and try to get to that loss, right? Okay, so, yeah, okay. so the way, the, the way I'm not 100% sure that I fully agree, that I completely understood what you asked, but I think the way this algorithm works is it will filter out the uh, the corrupt data. Oh, okay. And once it fills it out, it leaves mostly the correct data, and then you can run any estimate. Oh, uh, okay. That okay. answers the yeah. question. Any other? Uh, when was this last thing uh, where you said uh, um, uh, the continuous distribution to uh, degree D polynomials? Mm -hmm. When did that work start? Uh, I think the 1980s uh, people started. Uh, so, so here's a question. Instead of degree D polynomials, suppose you take a few distributions such as uniform and uh, Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So if you take two, three such distributions and take any continuous distribution and and uh, uh, approximate them by some combination of these. Right. Has that been done? So uh, I would like to think this is a nice, uh, this nice question. I'm trying to decide between the. Let me stay here so I can speak closer to the mic. So this is a really nice question. I would like to think that I like the, the other formulation a little better because, as I showed you, you can approximate uh, a Gaussian. With you know like uh, yeah degree three yeah degree three yeah. so you, so this the other technique gives you a lot more power because you can do a lot of stuff and if you allow yourself degree three then you also includes the Gaussians you definitely include uniform uniform is degree zero right, right? uniform distribution so it allows you to do that it allows you to do a mixture of Gaussians so it'll, so at the cost of maybe going to degree three you can do a lot of stuff and you don't need to worry so, specifically so, so let me ask you, is there okay. some notion of a universal collection of... Uh, this is universal. Oh, the, this collection is universal yeah. uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you can approximate uh, any distribution that you give me, uh, you can approximate with D and T, which is sufficiently large. If you give me any collection, any, any, any distribution, for D and T, that as you increase D, the number of pieces T, and D, okay. you can get close. That's number one. You're absolutely right. Sufficiently large is, good, is a good thing to point out. So if sufficiently large, you can do anything. So in that sense, it's yeah. dense. And, and the complement of that is that for common distributions like our Gaussians, they're bounds. And, and like I, I showed you uh, like the graph, but you right. can actually get like, you, 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 you can approximate a Gaussian very quickly by these things. And you can, you can make it more uh, quantitative than what I said. So for with, with, low, with, low, with low DNT. Right. So two things. One, it's dense. So sufficiently large, you can do it. And two, for common things like Gaussians, you don't need DNT to be very large. It's sufficiently. <laughs> So that's why this is a good college. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you. Oh, sorry, was there a question? So, yeah. so okay. for the computational experiments you're showing, the results, and you're showing how as beta goes up, your algorithm is 
pretty close to the Oracle. But I, I think I saw that it stopped at around 0.5. Once it passes 0.5, does it like go off a cliff or does it just start trending toward the naive? Or so 0.5 beta being 0.5? Yeah, I believe in one of the earlier graphs, yeah. So when beta is bigger, I can tell you. So when beta, uh, okay, we can, okay, okay. let me, I can tell you and then we can maybe go over the, the graph. Yeah. When beta is bigger than 0.5, I was trying to argue that there's nothing you can do because the adversary can come up with some R completely different distribution. There's an underlying distribution P. Right. The adversary can corrupt 60% of the sample. They'll take a different distribution P very far. It'll give you all the samples from that. There's no way for you to know that he's talking about 40%. I'll just, I'll just say that uh, first. So, so you see, if beta is bigger than 0.5, there's really nothing you can do. Right. What you can do uh, is you can say that um, uh, I'll give you a collection of distributions. So let's say beta is 0.5. So you know there's 40% that's 60% that are, could be anything. What you can do is that I can give you maybe three distributions, and the correct distribution will be one of them. So you can see in the case of 40, I'll give you maybe three distributions. One of them is going to be correct, and there'll be two more. So if, you know maybe they have, you know, the 60% maybe another distribution. I can give you some small number of um, distributions, and the correct distribution will be one of them. That you can do. And the way people use it is they say, okay, I'll give you this collection. And then in real life, maybe you get some, some few samples that now you reduced it to like maybe three or four distributions. It's enough to get maybe 20 samples and with, that you know are correct, like verified, and then you can know which distribution. And we can look and see if I have. Yeah, I think I have even more yeah. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk. So for the students who are here, for the sign code, so the code is uh, robust learn, uh, no space, all lowercase, robust learn.